Morning. My name is Dr. Susan Fennick, and I am the CEO and founder of Juvenile Justice Impact. Tonight we have with us Carlos Espinoza, who is a media veteran, and he is going to be telling us about some social trends with youth that he has seen over the years. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for having me here, Susan. Thank you. So what so what are some social issues that you've noticed in some trends? I mean, you're in media, you've been yeah. in media for years. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the trends that you've seen with youth um, that you've noticed over the years that you've been in media? Yeah, so probably one of the biggest is that, you know, media, think of media as a, uh, as a microphone, much like this one, right? And so when you have a, a, a tool or a vehicle to be able to put information out there, call it content. Everything, really the sort of generic term for everything you do, whether you're posting pictures or GIFs or you're putting out recordings or any of that, it's just content, right? And once content is out, it's out. It's not, it's very, very difficult to pull that content back, right? Just like the old adage says, once that arrow has flown, you're not getting that arrow back and it's out there. So one of the things, it's, it's, it's a powerful tool, but it's also a double-edged sword. And if people don't approach it with a sense of responsibility and understanding exactly how powerful it is, it could really cause them um, a lot of problems, a lot of damage, and have consequences far beyond you know, what they are thinking about or considering today. So that's a really important thing for people to consider, is when you put content out there, be aware of what the consequences of that content are going to be and what story it tells about you. In the long term. No matter the age. No matter the age. All the more reason why, but you know, think about when you're when you're younger and you can be impulsive and you know, maybe you're out partying one day and you have a couple of drinks or you know, you you right. you know, whatever you may be doing and you just kinda of put stuff out there. You don't even think about it, but it's there. And it's and it's searchable. So when you know, come time for you to find a job, maybe go to college, maybe, you know, do whatever it is you may want to do, two, three, down, two, three years down the road, companies or individuals, they do background checks sometimes, mm -hmm. right? They may find all this stuff and it may be content that's questionable and it may not help you in your cause. Sure. And you, you would even mention that sometimes people, it can affect your employment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so a, a number of companies today will look at social people's social media profiles. And, you know, you're in a situation where if a company wants to look at your social media profile to get a sense of, you know, who you are, it's almost like a background check, right? You can't, if a company says we want to, part of the requirement for getting a job here is to pass a background check. If you say, no, I do not want to take the background check, well, that's as far as you go. That's about right? as big as a red flag. You exactly. When you talk about a red flag, you immediately say, well, why would you not want to have right. a background check? Well, the same thing is going to happen with the request to look at your social media profiles. You know, you may say, well, I just tell them not to. Okay, then you don't want that job. Right. right? Because you're not going to get hired. You're not going to go any further in the process. And how do you feel that, how do you feel that some of the changes you've seen over the years with youth and social media? Well, that's the biggest thing is that, so we've gone in a very short period of time, call it 20 years. I mean, relatively speaking, it's a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're 20 years old, obviously, it seems like a long time because that's your entire lifespan. Or if you're 15 or 16, you, have, you know, 20 seems like it's very old, but it's actually a very short period of time. In those 20 years, think about it. We went from having four TV stations, right? NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox. Actually, Fox was the, the last one to come on. And then cable. And sometimes I give, I'll give presentations where we talk, where we show sort of the evolution of that. We went from four TV stations to eight, you know, to 16, to 30, and then came cable, then came satellite, then came dish. And now with the internet, right, the world wide web, think about all the different media outlets. There's thousands of channels. Yeah, there's thousands and thousands of channels, right? So with that has come accessibility. And you never know how many people can see a video or a piece of content you put out. I'll give you an example. A, a major network may spend $50 million to create a pilot. And that pilot is a flop, right? And, it, and they cancel it within weeks. Somebody who's 18 years old takes their iPhone and they go out and they shoot a video and they post it on YouTube and it gets 50 million views. That's an enormous amount of eyeballs, right? Right. And hopefully that's a good video and it's not, you know, something that's compromising because stuff gets out there that's compromised. So if you put a video out there that's great, okay, that's a good thing. But what if you put out there a video that either you're in it or you put it out? where it's really compromising. 
There it is. There's no getting it back. Right. right. It's out there. It's going to follow you forever. And that's something that I think, again, getting back to the point of responsibility, I think a lot of kids today see it as they have, you know, it, it takes time for people to evolve and understand the power and the responsibility in a tool like that. Mm-hmm. But because it's come so fast, I mean, and when you really think about it, it's only, let's call it the last eight years, right, where we've had Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and it's TikTok, you know, and we've gone from what used to be called not so smartphones to the term used to be smartphones to differentiate between phones like these that have operating systems and apps and so forth and you're online. Do you remember the flip phones? Uh, yes. You know, you could barely take a picture with I them. I used my right? flip phone yeah. until it was dangling on its hinges. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so before we had the phones that we have today, there was still, it wasn't quite as dangerous because you couldn't take a lot of pictures, you couldn't take video, right? You couldn't just snapshots of everything and they were in the, they were just in your phone and they're just in your yeah and they weren't you know uploaded and no. not a lot of memory and <laughs> you know it was one or two little pictures but now because you've got this incredibly powerful tool in your hand and you just decide you know somebody's doing something crazy and they just say oh take a video of it and then post it well there it is and it may not even be the individual but the people around them that are sure. taking those videos and and they're out there so it's it's an enormous responsibility it's a, it's a really um, powerful tool that you know kids need to really be aware of its its potential downsides. And is there any aspect of um, media that has affected, like say, youth in schools? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the same thing. It's the use of technology. Uh, I'm not a teacher, but I can imagine. You know, show me a 16 year old doesn't have a phone, right? Even younger. Or even younger, <laughs> right? And so imagine now the challenges for the learning environment because. It's also become so fragmented where, you know, you're, they're constantly just stuck on their phones watching. Like mm-hmm. you're a teacher or in an environment like that and you have to be battling with these kids on their phones. That's also a big challenge, right? So even being able to focus and learn, I mean, even as an adult, it's hard for us because we have so many things that we can look at. I mean, you look at your Facebook, you look at your Instagram, you can look at TikTok videos, you can see the things that people are sending you and it's, it's becoming increasingly harder for people to focus I, I can agree with that. Are there times where you've where you've done interviews or you've spoken to to families or parents where where or there's has there been stories that are related to um, some effects of the social media with you? Like, um, I personally have not. I mean, I, I'm I'm keenly aware. I keep an eye on these things, and I'm very um, I, I keep a close eye on this. I'm very observant, so. One of the things that I notice is, you know, as we talk about family and relationships and interpersonal skills, here's, here's one thing that I have noticed is that we need to have interpersonal skills. We need to have language skills. We need to be able to communicate. We're communal creatures, right? And that's what keeps us and that's what helps us and stay happy. So we're in an interesting and ironic place in that we now have the ability to have 5,000 friends on Facebook, but we've never been lonelier, right? right? So you have all these people that are quote-unquote friends that are putting content out there showing how amazing and happy and wonderful their lives are, and many people are very miserable. It's just kind of an affront that they take pictures. You know, It's kind of like seeing the... You ever watch uh, the trailer to a movie and you go, oh, wow, that's going to be a great movie? Yeah. Well, you've basically watched the entire movie exactly. in the trailer, and then you see the movie, you're like, oh, what a terrible movie. Right. But, that, you know, that, they that could has fill, happened before. Yeah, they could fill 30 seconds... Right? To get something really interesting. With the highlights. With the highlights. But that's it. You've seen the whole thing. So you might as well just watch the trailer. Then. And so I think a lot of that parallels what happens on social media, which is youth, all of us, but everything that we talk about, you have to understand that there's an enormous responsibility and anything that could be addictive, if you will, you know, teens are much more prone to doing it without even being aware of it. Right? So they're just kind of out there, you know, creating all this stuff, putting it out there, but very unhappy. You have all these friends. You have a thousand friends. And you don't know any of them. And oh. you've never been lonelier. There's been times where people are like, are you friends with so-and-so? I'm like, I really don't know. Yeah. Like, you're friends with so-and-so. I'm like, I, I don't know. I sure. don't know. There's 5,000 people. I don't know who they are. Yeah. I mean, I know yeah. who like our, our group is. Right. You know, our, our close-knit group yeah. who we all know. But outside of that, um, really. <laughs> yeah, one thing I, I think it's important, and I emphasize to, to parents, is to you got to have time when you, you're not going to be on phones. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important for the parents to make the example. So I talk about being observant. You know, sometimes I, I'll see families that are having dinner, 
somewhere, and the mom and the dad and the kids are sitting there, but they're all on their phones. I've seen that. And I, and so I think, many wow, this is, this is, is really problematic, opposite. right? Where <laughs> you're all sitting there, but you're all escaped in your own world, watching what somebody else is doing, and they're probably at a table doing the same thing, watching what you're doing. So it's not like we're all chasing this phantom, because I'm curious what you're doing, you're curious what I'm doing, and all we're doing is being curious about each other's lives, and we're not living these lives. One of the educators I, I recently spoke to and talked about the addiction to electronics yeah. and how it stunts the uh, developmental growth of, of, of youth. Sure. Because they're missing that interaction. Yeah, no, no, no social skills. I mean, when we sat down for dinner, we that we sat down for dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we, it was you know our family and the brothers and cousins or whoever yeah. maybe over and. We sat down and we passed the dishes. We helped clean up. You know, we talked about our days. We talked about school. We talked about our families, the upcoming, like, say, birthdays or yeah. whatever might be coming down the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that that kind of got lost a lot. Yeah, and it's it's a real problem, not just for for these individuals and their families, but really for our society because adults too. Well, for everybody, yeah. but right, our society collectively is made up of all the individuals. So the people are going to be the entrepreneurs, the business owners, the bosses, the teachers, professors, and doctors, and so forth, are all, they were all teens at one point, right? So the teens of today, we're seeing that they're the ones that are eventually going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And they're, they're growing up <clears throat> with real, a real lack of social skills because of that. Exactly, that's yeah. what we're talking about. So if you think about what the, what the home environment was, was kind of a, a training ground for them to develop Communication skills, learning skills. Sure. Right. Hey, you're communicating with mom, with dad, with your cousins, with your brothers, with your with your inner circles. Now there's no communication there, so they're not developing those skills kind of in the safe space. Then they get out into the real world, and guess what? They don't seem to be able to communicate. They're uncomfortable with communicating, and they never develop those skills. So I've seen that in the work environment where, when we bring, uh, when we have a collective project going on and you're working with maybe Gen Xers or people that are younger, they don't have the ability to communicate. And, and you know, they prefer to email back and forth or text back and forth in the office. They're IMing in the very office. But <laughs> they're they're, over there, they're, like, they're, they're like, he or she is sitting right there, <laughs> and they're IMing instead of just going over and talking with the person. Right? Like but, well, they, they become comfortable with hiding behind the technology. And they, so they're not forced to develop those, those social interactivity skills or the ability to interact. And, you know, when you were in, in a world where you have to do that, let's say start at home and mom and dad said, hey, we got to talk and we've got to interact with each other. You were forced to do it, right? And look, if you never, if you're never forced to do anything that you don't want to do as a kid, then you'll never do anything, right? Because you just want to do what you do. And, it, and if it's always up to the kid, it's like... Okay, well, they'll never do any of the things that I, I wouldn't have ever, you know, I wouldn't have eaten broccoli, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have done, that's the whole point of... Oh, we had chores, we had yeah. what we were going to eat, what we weren't going to eat, and strict, strict. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but now, because of media, I wouldn't call it even media, because I think of media as, think of it as the content. It's the technology, right? So the technology being, think of it as the pipes mm-hmm. that are laid, and the media is the the content, right, or whatever it is that goes to those pipes. Well, the pipes have become more abundant and bigger and faster, and now a lot of what goes to those pipes is junk. Exactly. I've, I've recently been asked to, you know, speak at various schools, and um, I think that this is one of the topics that I'm going to talk about because, yeah. well, I mean, there's so many... Um, but I think that this is important, you know, for the teachers, mm-hmm. for the students, and just for, for everyone who's, who would be, you know, participating in, in the group or I'm speaking at the schools. Because, mm-hmm. But they're also aware of that as well, you know, because mm-hmm. it's, it's not some, you know, the adults, like you said, it's everyone. I mean, they're just as addicted to the electronics as the kids yeah, are. So it is. how do you, like, break that cycle, you know? Well, it's got to start, <clears throat> I think the adults, <clears throat> first of all, have to be aware of it and they have to take their responsibility and the leadership role. Um, there will be kids that are going to be the sort of, the folks that are on the edge, more, more responsible. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that, I think, tends to, when you see kids that are playing those roles, they come from 
an environment that's supportive and that teaches those things. So if they have parents that are supportive, they're intelligent, they're aware of these things, and they themselves are not just telling the kids not to do that, but they exercise it, then they you, when you see these kids in public interacting, you're like, wow, these kids are sharp, right? They're doing this. But this you look at the household, and, they, and they're, they're coming from that. It's a big problem, and it's something that definitely has to be addressed because as a collective, as a nation, we are losing ground to countries that are... It's a competitive marketplace, right? The world's a competitive place. So countries that are that are investing into social skills, communication skills, and quite frankly, raising kids with that level of awareness are going to, are going to have an advantage. I can see that, and it's just, and it's it's hard to break the cycle because mm-hmm. you have the adults that are just yeah. as intertwined yeah. as the youth are. Yep. So I guess it just comes down to the individual. Um, it comes down to the individuals and their their values. Yeah, and that's that's kind of a, a slippery slope when we start talking about that, right? But it, but it, it, or it's more complex, I should say. Yeah. But but that is the reality, right? We we can't just assume like, well, it's schools and teaching because commercial pressures on all of this. Um, I'll give you an example. It's become fashionable and very trendy now to get tattoos, and you know they're seeing through a lot of social media, through the enormous outlets of media, whether it's in sports or through social media or whatever it may be, where some of these uh, individuals, it tends to be either, you know, uh, people that follow because they're artists or performers or sports or anything like that. Well, <clears throat> what they don't think about is um, if you go to a, a Raiders game right now and you see the Raiderettes, uh, I think this is the case, they'll point me this, but I think it's the case, they don't have any tattoos, they don't have any visible tattoos. So if you have aspirations to be a Raider Red or a cheerleader, you're not thinking today when you're 15, 16, you're just thinking it's cool. Mm-hmm. You're getting all these tattoos. Then when you go to audition, they go, oh, we don't want people with tattoos, right? Because when you think about this, when you are in a position like that or a swimsuit model or something, you're representing a brand, right? right? And the brand wants not to objectify the person, but a clean slate, so to say. So when they put their brand, you wear that brand. Exactly. What you see is that brand. And they don't want to associate necessarily that brand with this other communication you may have on you, which could be, who knows? It could be a logo. It could be a name. It could be, you know. And so why they don't want, no one wants to take away from their brand with this confusion or confusing canvas, so to say. Right? Again, not to objectify the person, but we can understand they want something that's a certain look and if you have tattoos all over you... No, I, I've actually... I've seen people in the workplace mm-hmm. where they have these um, sleeves that are mandated mm-hmm. so they don't show, they don't any, show any, yeah. any of the tattoos. And yeah. like, what, what, what in the world? One of the girls had an ace bandage wrapped all around her arm. I'm like, what happened to you? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of silly. She's like, well, you know, I can't show my tattoos. Right, right. Because you know, they're it's... not, you know, considering... And then, all right, so the question is, well, you know, individualism, and I want to express myself. Okay, sure, I totally get that. But you have to understand that we live in a world, right, where things are what they are. So you could say, well, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want, and, you know, and I'm, it's just going to happen for me because I remember being a world. Like, you know, when I'm 19, I'm going to be a millionaire, and I've, you know, been an astronaut, a race car driver, professional this, professional that. Well, that's because we live in this fanciful world, and as you get older, you realize, oh, wow. You know, you got to deal with the realities of life, like paying your bills and, you know, doing something with yourself because you're not 19 forever. So, I, again, I think it goes back to considering what you're doing and thinking about the long-term consequences, not just because it's trendy and because your favorite sports star has tattoos all over them. Like, the other day I saw a picture, I think he's a hip-hop artist or some performer, and I don't know, he looks like he's 20 years old, and he's just got tattoos Everywhere. Everywhere. Like covered. I've seen it everywhere. on the face. Yeah. And, and so I'm now like, it's becoming oh his face goodness. and you're thinking. <laughs> and so now he wants to show off these tattoos. So he walks around with no shirt on. <laughs> so, <laughs> like a walking billboard. Yeah. It's like yeah. a walking billboard. Right? But I figure, say, hey, I spent all, you know, all this effort to put these tattoos on. So all I want to see, show them to the world. <laughs> That's great. When you're 18, 19, you know, what are you going to do? Unless you end up being that hip hop artist or, you know, and that's part of your, your thing. Right. But, you know. 99% of the time, you're not going to end up doing that, right? You may end up doing something in music, but let's face it, everybody's become, every kid wants to be LeBron James, but 
how many LeBron James are there? Exactly. So. No, it's um, it like the point you're making. It, it's hard because I mean, when you are a teenager, you're not thinking into your 30s, 40s, 50s. Oh, it's forever. It's yeah, like, you know, and, you'll think you'll be a millionaire by then. And, and you don't I've, care. I mean, I've known people that have that have tried to have them removed, and it, I hear it's quite painful. Oh yeah, never mind <laughs> on your face. Right? What do you do when you, you change your mind about these tattoos on your face? Right. Um, but it's just no. It's just interesting because. You know, when we were talking earlier, previous to this podcast, about social media and media and the effects it has on youth, mm -hmm. and it even, you know, when I was speaking to someone who's working right in the trenches of sex trafficking, you know, they were talking about how these girls or boys can get a message on their phone, yeah. oh, hey, you're cute, do you want to go meet the mom? Yeah. Oh, sure, why not? You know, and then that kind of... And not kind of, it starts that whole process of being groomed, and mm -hmm. and that was uh, something that's come up recently with some of the other people that I've spoken to on mm -hmm. different podcasts, or just people that I know in general, or people that are actually in the in the police force that are trying to tackle this whole sex trafficking issue, and and it's about the the firewalls that need to be put up for these kids, yeah, and these youth. Even you know, very very young age girls and boys, yeah. all the way up to their teen years, and even their, even going into a little bit older in their youth ages, and that's 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 the beginning of, of a lot of problems, yeah, especially absolutely. with sex trafficking. And sure. uh, one of the cases that I was recently told was was that's just that's exactly how it happened. You know, mom and dad were busy; they weren't home; they had a lot of babysitters a lot of the time, and and I completely understand. I mean, everyone's trying to make a living and support the support mm -hmm. the bills and keep the refrigerator filled and yeah. but in the meantime and it's not it's not the case in every case but mm -hmm. it was just like an example of how um, you know the, they were the the daughter was on the social media so much mm -hmm. and certain people would chime in and say you know see these pictures or not if, even if there wasn't any pictures they yeah. just get attracted to the voice or something sure that's sure. all it takes well, it doesn't take much, you know, part of the challenge, I think, when, when you're youth, and look, I was there too, you think you know, and you don't know, and it's very hard for people to tell you, uh, because when you think you know, then it puts you in a position of vulnerability, because when you don't know what you don't know, you're walking around and you can be easily sort of uh, led, led astray by somebody who's older, who's wiser, who's more experienced, who knows sort of how to press your hot buttons and, and how to draw you in on these things. So I think part of the, one of the biggest challenges that we have today is that we have this incredible flow of information that we just didn't deal with when you and I were growing up, right? There was no limited amounts of information. Mm -hmm. So we had to, we had to, we process smaller amounts of information, right? There was A and B and C, maybe you need to pick one and three. But now there's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, you know, all the way like to X, Z. Yeah, exactly, on the channels. Which means, you need to have the brain power to be able to connect the dots and process more and more information and decipher between what is good and what is not good. And part of the challenge is the double-edged sword of that is that when we have such a constant slow of information and it is affecting the development of kids in their cognitive skills and their ability to problem solve, the ability to differentiate, because those lines have gotten very blurred. Mm -hmm. Like you used to know like this was something that was bad and this was something that was good. Well, now, it's, it's all sort of blurred, right? And this is a real problem for kids and for youth, which ties right back to the media. So now that this is the content going through the pipes. We're living in a time when we need to be smarter and more discerning, and we seem to be not as smart and less discerning. Not as smart because... Because we're overwhelmed with the information. So in other words... I don't mean we're not smart in terms of our ability, but we, we've sort of been lulled or numbed mm -hmm. because we can't make good decisions, or it's harder to make good decisions because you have so much information coming at the same time. Exactly. I mean, some of the things we see on social media are not always reality. They're not. And, and when you think about it, and this, this all impacts the generations coming up. Uh, there are people out there, they're grown men and women, who argue that the world is flat. Oh. And they swear by this, We're right? Still on that. 
well, think about it. This is like from the dark ages, right? So you think like, hey, technology and telescopes, and, and they have arguments for this. Like, well, this is all fake, and you know, when you see pictures from the star, from uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, space station or anything that is outside the Earth, that proves that the Earth is round, it shows it. Or if you look at you know, via telescope and you see the horizon, it's round. All that is all fake. The Earth is truly, truly flat. That's like taking a step back to the dark ages they where they, they thought... Didn't, they didn't make that eighth grade project of the solar system? No. Uh, apparently not because, you know, they, they're going back to the time where, you know, people thought, hey, if you sailed out to the, o- the edge of the ocean, It'll your ship off. would fall off, right? right. And you couldn't yeah. walk out to the edge. Yeah, really so it's, it's amazing to see that, but it's like, wait a minute, with all the advanced knowledge, science, technology you have, that people are actually going backwards in some ways, a long way, and they'll argue tooth and nail that the Earth is flat. And you're like... Okay. Well, there's some These people. Days? Yeah, there's there are, there are organizations out there and the groups of people that will argue until they're blown the face of the earth is flat, and they'll show you all kinds of crazy models. So it's like, how do you win this argument? Because clearly they they're not really interested in what is truth or what is rational. Mm-hmm. They're just interested in, in maintaining their own or their own idea. Right? But that's also why there are people who say, hey. Sasquatch is real, and they're out there searching for the for Bigfoot, right? Yeah. Or or searching for the Loch Ness monster. I was just going to say you know, the Loch Ness monster. Yeah, or, or any of these things. <laughs> well, that that kind of content can can get pumped out there, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes when you say, "Hey, you know, the moon is made of cheese," on this end, you're like, "No, the moon isn't made of cheese. I'm smart enough to figure that out, right? Like, I eat cheese, and the moon's not made of cheese, right?" <laughs> Right. And the other extreme. So when you have these extremities of, of beliefs, okay, but as you get closer and closer to the middle, right, and you have like, hey, okay, so it's not made of cheese, but it is, you know, something else, or there, there's smaller differentiators between, you know, truth and not truth, people get overwhelmed with it, and it, it's hard for them. So this is what I mean. We need to be smarter, more discerning than before. I should, I should say smarter. We need to have the ability to think Right. In order to separate and comprehend. and comprehend. And the abundance, the overabundance of media makes it very hard for adults to do this. Right. These are adults who are out there saying the world is flat. Never mind now for teens who are developing their minds or belief systems, right? Figuring out what the world is, they're even more confused by it. So this is where this is the, the bad side of that double distort. Are there um, a lot of people that you that you've met along your years of being in media mm-hmm. that how do they describe the pros and cons of the social media? Do you feel as though it's? I mean, we've got the the world is flat people, mm-hmm. and then the the moon is made out of cheese people, and then yeah. we have the people with reality. And yeah, I think here. people are coming to terms with. Look, social media is really new. I remember when Facebook came online. It was 2004, 2005. I was sitting in my, my dining room just like this, and uh, you know, my girlfriend's house was like, oh, you know, Facebook, and it's coming on. First of all, I thought the name was the stupidest thing in the world, like Facebook. It just didn't make sense. It's like, what the heck? Why do they call it Facebook? And I thought, ah, that's a dumb train. It'll never stick. Remember, there was another one called MySpace. Oh, right. right and, right. you know, that was the leader, in fact. They were head of, of Facebook, and then MySpace, you know, disappeared. So this was 2004 when it, when it started. Now it just seems like it's been around forever, but it's really not that long ago. So, excuse me. So the you know what's happened is again the point I made earlier. The pipes for information have gone from from relatively small to huge in a very fast in a very short period of time, and I don't think people have quite adapted to the potential consequences of it on the downside. On the, on the good side, obviously, hey, we're now connected, we're interacting, we're communicating more. Now we're seeing the consequences of it as well, which are, oh, crap, you know, this also means more responsibility. This also means teens can look at anything. This also means, as a parent, how do you control what your teen does see? Or when you're a kid, I mean, how do you know they're not going to 2 o'clock in the morning talking to God knows who? Exactly. Right? So that's, I think, where we're seeing it. And I think the best description of it is it is truly a very powerful double-edged sword with two very sharp swords, uh, two sharp edges. And I think, I think our, our role and responsibility is to educate people, mm-hmm. to 
to let them understand, like you said, the pros and cons, yeah. the downsides, and the effects that it can have long term. Like you said, the social skills mm -hmm. for someone who's always glued to electronics. You know, like you said, when they get out into the real world, they're so used to being in the electronic world yeah. that there's no comparison between the two. Yeah, it, it is. It does come down to education. It, it's got to be a uh, a very uh, a consistent and very conservative effort, and really um, a number of different people being involved, both the schools and the parents, educators, and there needs to be a much greater level of awareness and, and understanding that there's a responsibility from common folks, right? Sure. So, hey, understanding that your awareness and one of my personal pet peeves is when I, when I see people at dinner and the mom and dad, especially when they have young kids, mom and dad are on their phones. They're sitting there. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I want to go over and like smack the phone out of their hands. I want to smack them in the head or something. Like, your kid who is four or five, you know, seven, and they're just there dangling around and you're sitting there on your phones, God knows looking at what. Like, this is time you should be paying attention to your kids. The reason it's concerned for me is, hey, those same kids are the ones that are going to be growing up being either productive members of society or not, yeah. or somewhere in between, right? And it's up to the parents or the caregivers or the, you know, the adults in their life to, to set the example. To first, to be aware of that. So I think there needs to be a lot more education, to your point, on helping parents be sick. Because sometimes people are just unaware of it. They don't think about it. But it's like, if you don't educate your kids and you're on the phone constantly... What are they going to do? Exactly. And then how do you know what they're, what they're watching, who they're talking with, and what influences are, are, are being impressed upon them? We're, we're just now in the beginning stages of basically mapping out the next, this up, up and coming year with our workshops. And I, I, think, I think this should definitely be one of the topics that we talk about. And, I think it's foundational. Yeah. And I've actually spoken to one of the uh, members of the Las Vegas Central Police and one of the things we want to do is incorporate the, the parents. Has to be. Incorporate the parents more into the workshops. Not all of them. You know, like when we, um, certain ones won't be as pertinent as others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like when we have the new fitness challenge and we're all going to the different circuits and, and so on and so forth. They're always welcome and some mm -hmm. of them have joined. But I think that when we have certain topics like, like this, definitely where we spoke earlier about it bringing both, you know, whether it's the parents or the guardian or whoever is mm -hmm. responsible in their life, to have them be a part of, of these workshops. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a challenging thing. Like, I find myself having these conversations with myself sometimes. Oh my gosh, this is incredibly powerful. I am a grown man, and I have challenges with it. I can imagine how hard it is for a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old coming up, especially because... For them, you know, this to me is kind of a novelty, but they grew up with, like, they came on the scene with this already. When they were <laughs> two or one, they already had an iPad, and yeah. they were looking at these things and playing with them. So this is so much a part of their, their life, and it's almost like, I don't want to say in their DNA, but it certainly worked into their habits from a child, I mean, like, imprinted, right? So it is challenging. One of the things, you mentioned Metro Police, um, I've been with different companies that have tried to address this in different ways, which is... You know, people texting and driving. Like, here we are, and there's lots and lots of uh, accidents, unfortunately, or fatalities, where kids or teenagers are driving and texting and they get into an accident. Yeah. That happened to my dad. Um, a girl, this is going bad, thankfully he, he was fine, but maybe, I don't know, 70 years ago, uh, a young girl ran into him head on. You know, she, and it turns out, she was probably texting. Yeah. Right? When I was just uh, speaking with the owner of the Huntington Learning Center, he was talking a lot about the same problems with social media and mm -hmm. electronics with youth. And he was just saying that he um, he knew this one one person who almost got hit by a car mm -hmm. and walked into it, I think, a, a pole walking down the sidewalk. Yeah. And, you know, these type of it's things. It's crazy. These distractions. I see it all the time. Like, I'll, I'll see kids and even adults walking and texting or looking at something. Not even paying, I mean, now you're talking about physical harm. You could be walking into oncoming traffic, running posts, falling over. I mean, something could really seriously happen. At least when you're walking, it's just you, potentially, right? Not that you ever want that to be the case. But God forbid, you know, you are in a car or a 
truck or something. And it's and amazing it, how you get so you get drawn in. Things are sucked in. Yeah. You know, and and and, and it's just like nothing around you is yeah. exists. Last uh, a few years back in New York, there was a really tragic accident. A, a train conductor, it was like an Amtrak or something, okay. was turns out texting and had a full. You know, the train was full of people. I think it was a commute either home, home or to, to the city. And he, you know, he wasn't supposed to go very fast around the curve. It was supposed to be like half the speed or a third of the speed. He was too busy texting. And the thing came off the tracks and a bunch of people died, lost their lives because, you know, here's a train conductor. And you could see it, right? Because they could see the, the phone records. And clearly at the same time the train comes off the tracks, here you were texting. And they're able to do that now. They're able to of course see, you can see it's if, all time stamped. If, um, yeah, if like say I'm on my phone and uh, I don't know, I plow into a car or, or a tree or anything. Well, all you got to do is look at the exact. They can yeah, they can actually look at the phone and, and see yeah. what time the accident well, happened and see the see the different transactions. Well, the phone's got a GPS on it, right? So that's how you use Google Maps and everything else. It's got a GPS right. that's functioning and time step on on tags so they could just match up the GPS and timestamp and you know these these tragedies happen because we are so drawn into it again it's an incredibly powerful tool it's like putting a I'll say for lack of a better term right now comes to mind like a weapon in the hands of youth and look what happened in was it Minnesota last week where parents bought this kid a gun and he took the gun their parents bought to school and fatally you know, took the lives of, of other kids. And you're thinking like, well, it, to some extent, you may not see this, the, the results of it immediately, but those are, those are some of the consequences. And that's what in some ways makes it more dangerous because the consequences are more far reaching right? and, and across large swaths of society. It is amazing how, you know, the different generations of like our, our grandparents, our parents, yep. us, the the youth, yeah. and that there are almost like black and white differences. Yeah. And, you know, I remember we when we were, uh, when I was younger, you know, we used to try to have a little privacy on the phone, but meanwhile, the core is like ripping the phone out of the wall. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I remember getting a lot of... Uh, uh, Friend's house, they'd have a huge, like thirty foot long board where you could literally walk, walk into another room, close the door, yeah. and you know, be on there. But you know, you had to be home to get the call, or, or oh, yeah. you know, be home to yeah, make yeah, the call. Yeah. And it wasn't like you know, just calling from anywhere. And you know, that brings up another point, which is as it relates to youth, which is we were already having challenges when it comes to youth becoming uh, more sedentary, all kinds of health issues because of the foods we're consuming. But we're seeing more and more of that because technology certainly communication being one of them, now you can do everything from, from your home. Do you feel as though the social media has, has had any impact on the youth and violence? I do, because it, it, uh, it makes it very casual and uh, very easy to see and to support, to be a voyeur, right? just to watch the violence. More of it you watch, the more it becomes normalized, and it trivializes it. That's a good ways. word, normalized. Yeah. Accepted. It's accepted and it's trivialized and it's just normal. Like, you know, these kids that are having fights or beating up or jumping someone at school and recording it. And then again, here's the double edged sword. They, they're doing something because they think it's going to be cool and they're going to post it. And they're also not considering that this is a police record. Like, you are recording right. the very evidence mm-hmm. that's going to, that they're going to use, uh, you know, against you for, for this uh, activity. For a long time. And you're just like, you know, what if anything, oh, it, it's all, it's a short-term mentality. Oh, it's going to be cool, I'm going to beat this person up, I'm going to take it out of man, and I'm going to post it. And it's going to be seen as glorious. Well, it's not going to be seen seem so glorious when you're in court, and they're pulling up the very thing you've recorded, and this is what, you know, it's, it's the evidence for your crime. So, A, we shouldn't be doing that. B, you don't even realize the danger of the tool that you have in your hand because you're recording this. It's a blessing and a curse. It's double-edged sword. Yeah, so many, and, so many positive things come out of it, yeah. and then again, so many negative things won't. But and you have to have, you have to be a thinking, rational, sensible person to make use of a powerful tool. You know, that's no different than putting a uh, 
a, uh, a hacksaw in somebody's hands, or a um, uh, what's the worst thing now? A, a bus saw, or no, what was it you cut trees down? A, a chainsaw. Thank you. You know, you don't put the, you don't put a, an incredibly powerful chainsaw in the hand and, and start it and rev it up and then give it to a, a four year old. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. Right, and then you know, like, what would they do with this? Oh, maybe I'll just you know start cutting up the furniture, or maybe cut up the dog. You know, I mean, any of these things, and, and a lot of that is what happens. Where we are, in my opinion, with the the abundance of media that's out there and the tools to access it. Well, a lot of a lot of what we're doing on these podcasts, you know, we're, we're talking about different different problems or concerns and the solutions. Mm -hmm. and, and what we're talking about tonight is engaging the parents more, educating yeah. more, talking to the schools more. Yeah. And for sure, when I I've been invited to speak to a few schools coming up, it's one of the things that I'm going to be. Um, one of the, yeah. it's not going to be my entire topic for the entire visit, but it's definitely in the top five of, of topics that I'll be discussing. Yeah, I think it's foundational. It really is because the the issue has to be addressed. In order for kids to learn, in order for parents to be better parents, in order for kids to be, you know, give instruction and to be in a position where they can absorb that information. We have to address this issue of attention, uh, focus, uh, communication skills, you know, because they don't, I, I'm seeing this all the time. You, you're hiring youth and they can't communicate. So you take the phone out of their hand, you yeah, take your TikTok out of their hand, you can't, you can't text, you can't post a picture, you've got to sit there and talk with your boss. And your boss may be upset at you and they're going to yell at you. They're just going to cry. And sometimes they do because they're not used to the the, interaction. that interaction. And the responsibility of the interaction. Yeah. Huge problem. So that would be, in my opinion, one of the top one, two issues that need to be addressed because everything else is secondary to that. Mm -hmm. You can be smart. You can be capable. You can have all the skill sets in the world. But the biggest thing they don't have is communication skills. You're going nowhere. Most definitely. Well, what we try to do here is we try to, like we said, bring up some, some concerns and some solutions, yeah. and I hope that all of our listeners out there learn something from our conversation, and thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Is there any way that anyone can get a hold of you if they have any questions or comments? Yeah, or? I'm all about it, so um, I'm on social media. Uh, very strategically, uh, if they control <laughs> what I do you on there. You had to throw in that strategically yeah, after yeah, all this conversation. Yeah, right? I, I try to, you know, I'm very diligent about not like putting a bunch of nonsense and fluff up there. Um, but uh, I'm on Instagram is Carlos Connects, and um, on Facebook it's really where I spend most of my social media content I put on, on Instagram. Uh, Facebook it's Carlos Espinoza in Las Vegas. There are a couple of other Carlos Espinosa out there, but recognize the face if you. <laughs> You know, if not, you'll make friends with other Carlos Espinosa right. and then if you start they commenting, they, you. they may, they okay. may, but uh, yeah, I'm on the social media channel, so I'm always looking and I, and I love interacting, I love engaging with people and telling them, helping tell stories. So. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you, you have such an impact on our community. I know you have so much to do with the, with the, the media and the people that you're interviewing and the content that you're putting out there really helps, yeah. helps our community. Uh, we can be reached at juvenilejusticeimpact at gmail.com. Our website is www.impactjji.com, or you can give us a call at 888-JJI-0010. And feel free to hit the donate button, because that is one of the ways we're able to have some of these incredible workshops that we've had. 2022 is going to be awesome. We have some really great workshops coming up, along with some other uh, programs that we're going to be developing. And... It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be very inspiring to a lot of the youth in our community. And cool. I'll be inviting you, of course. And I'd love to, love to participate. <laughs> Carlos has been a very big supporter of Juvenile Justice Impact, and we're all very appreciative of that. And we know how, how busy everyone is with their time and their schedules, and you can't say enough about how much we've appreciated your, your time and, and your, your time with, the, with our company. Yeah. So. 
Well, happy to do so. Happy to do so. Thank you, everybody. All righty. Well, thank you so much. And we'll have you on soon, I'm sure, again, as a follow-up. And at the very least, we'll see you at our next, at our next workshop. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you.